Heard any rumors? You guys must know something. I have not. I heard Rick smells. Shut up, Larry. Games with cinematic dialogue, lip sync, photorealistic humans, and non-linear quests were basically only available to massive studios with millions of dollars to spend on their game. I spent five years building Narrative 3 to change that, and this guide is going to take you from a total beginner with Narrative and give you the skills to make any mission or dialogue you can think of. We're going to start with the boring old third person template project, enable Narrative, import some metahumans, learn to use the quest and dialogue editors, and even record our own facial animations. By the end of this tutorial, you will know how to make any quest or dialogue you can dream of. This video is 90 minutes long because it covers every single piece of narrative, but here's a quest we'll make during the guide in about 15 minutes. Do you need any help? I'm not doing so well. There's a wall coming and we don't have any weapons. Can I help? Would you? We'll need a sword and a shield to defend the castle. You'll learn useful techniques like starting a quest when a given dialogue option is selected, or having an NPC's dialogue lines change depending on a condition like whether we currently have a quest going with them. You found the weapons? Sorry, haven't found the weapons yet. We'll also show you how to use non-cinematic dialogue. We'll use some of that to get our player to say things as he moves through the quest. I should bring those weapons back to Rick. How's the quest coming along? You found the weapons? I sure have. We'll cover adding your own reward systems, or even having a dialogue line show up after you've completed someone's quest. Hey, could I get a reward for helping you earlier? Sure thing. Here you go. We'll show you much, much more too, like adding a custom event for running some code when a dialogue line plays, or adding custom events to do things like opening a trader's shop if you ask to see it or making custom conditions so dialogue lines only show up if we have a certain item or a high enough speech level, whatever condition you can think of. We'll even show you how to use Narrative's save feature to save the player's quests and dialogue to disk, and even how to use Narrative's built-in multiplayer functionality if you have a game with multiplayer. I'll even show you how to use ChatGPT to generate dialogue using AI. To follow this tutorial, you will need to buy Narrative, and I understand it is an expensive plugin for some people, and so if you're unsure, feel free to check out the free demo we have. Also check out our Discord, there's over a thousand customers in there helping each other out with Narrative, and we have almost a five-star average review on the marketplace. But if you're still unsure, if Narrative ends up not working for your game, feel free to email me and I will issue you a refund, because I really do stand behind this uh, plugin. But with that being said, I really hope you try it, and let's begin. Once you do purchase Narrative, you'll have the Open and Launcher option, so go ahead and click on that. And then when that does open up in the Epic Games Launcher, just click on Install the Engine, and then click the drop-down and select 5.2, because we're going to be using Unreal Engine 5.2 today, and then just click Install. Once you've installed Narrative, we're going to be using Unreal Engine 5.2 today, so go ahead and open that up. Once it opens up, go to Games, and then go to the Third Person Template, and then I'm just going to call mine Narrative tutorial and then you can click on create all right so we're here inside of our third person narrative project and we're going to come up to edit plugins and under quests and dialogue you can see narrative 3 here just make sure that that is enabled so we're going to start off with the dialogue i've made this folder narrative and i've made a dialogues folder and i'm going to put my first dialogue inside of there so we're going to go to narrative and add our very first dialogue and I generally like to use D underscore and then the name of the dialogue. So in this case, I'm going to call it Rick because I'm going to call my character Rick. So we'll open up our Rick dialogue. And it's important to remember dialogue blueprints are just like any other blueprint you've ever used. The only difference is they also come with this dialogue editor window here. Kind of like how a widget blueprint is just a blueprint, but it comes with a UI designer. Dialogue blueprints just come with a dialogue designer in them as well. And so if you go to class defaults, you can see all of the speakers. There's always a player. The player doesn't have to talk, but the player is always there. But then there's the speakers array, and you can add as many different speakers as you like. And by default, there's just one so far called Rick, because that's he gets added by default. Um, and if you go to node color, you can change the color, which is quite useful. If you have a lot of speakers, it just helps you tell them apart a bit more easily. Now another little trick is generally I think it's a good idea to leave the first node empty 
and I'll explain why later. But um, generally, empty nodes just get skipped over. Um, but I'll explain more later about why you want to leave the root one empty. But we'll add another dialog line for Rick, and we'll just say, Hi, I'm Rick. And we'll compile and save. It's going to warn us that we're missing audio. That's fine. You can actually turn that off too. If you like, you can go to Edit Project Settings, and you can turn the warnings off by going to Narrative Dialogues, Editor, and just turn off Warn Missing Sound Cues. And now if we compile, you can see it doesn't give us a warning. So how do we actually try out that dialogue we've made? Well, to try it out, it's really easy. Um, we need to actually do a little bit of boring boilerplate stuff, but not too difficult. We're just going to go to the third person blueprints folder and go to blueprint, blueprint class, and click on player controller. We just have to add a player controller really quickly because the uh, third person project doesn't come with one. Open up the game mode, and then under player controller, just select that narrative one I just made. And now we'll open up a player controller. And generally you want to put your narrative uh, component on your player controller. This is because if you get into a car um, or, you know, you change your pawn that you're playing as, you want to keep all your quests and stuff valid, right? They should probably be on the controller. So generally speaking, you want to put narrative on your player controller. And let's go to the event graph. And we can actually try this out right away. We can try our dialogue out that we made by just dragging narrative in and typing begin dialogue. That's all you have to do, and then just select your dialogue. And this will begin our dialogue. Now the problem is, by default, um, there's obviously no UI on the screen, but narrative does actually come with some UI. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add the narrative UI to the screen. So just go to create widget. You'll only have to do all this once. This is just kind of boring setup stuff and uh, select narrative default UI, plug in the narrative component, and add the UI to the screen like this, add to viewport, and just hook that up. And that's all you have to do, very simple. Compile and save. And now if you hit play, it should begin our dialogue. And you can see it does, it says, hi, I'm Rick. You'll notice it actually points the camera at our player when Rick's talking, and that's because there's no Rick in the level, right? A narrative doesn't know how to point the camera at, but we'll fix that in a second. So let's go back into our Rick dialogue. We'll open it back up, and I want to just show you how to add options for the player. So if an NPC talks, like Rick is an NPC, um, the player can say something back to him. So if we add a player response, we can say, how are you, Rick? Compile and save, hit play. We have the option to say, how are you, Rick? And so again, it's just pointing the camera at our player, but you'll see when we actually add Rick to the level, um, it's gonna change. And you can see it says my desktop name there. Um, we can change that as well. All right, so let's actually put a character in the level that represents Rick, right? Cause Rick's just not even in the level. It doesn't really make any sense. So we're gonna go to third person blueprints and we're gonna add a blueprint class actor and I'm going to call it BP underscore dialogue trigger because it's going to be kind of a trigger when you walk up to it it's going to trigger the dialogue to start so we'll go to components and add a sphere collision and we'll make it I don't know 150 and we want it so that when the player walks into the sphere it begins the dialogue and to do that we can go down to collision presets. I'm just going to go to overlap only pawn. And then I'm going to go to on component begin overlap. I'm going to take the other actor and cast it to a third person character. And in fact, we don't even need to do that. In narrative, you can just do get narrative component from target. Basically, given an actor, it'll grab that narrative component for us. It does all the heavy lifting. And then you can literally just do begin dialogue. So it's pretty straightforward. You could grab the controller and get the narrative component, but this is a nice little helper function. And then we'll just hit Rick. And that's it. Really simple. The last thing I'm going to do is I'll add a uh, character for Rick, right? So I'm going to go to add skeletal mesh. And we will go to mesh asset and select Manny. And we're just going to go to the rotate tool and make sure that Manny is facing forwards. You can see down here the X is the forward direction, so we want him to face that direction. 
and then animation mode asset and then we're just going to do idle so just put a nice little animation on them and that's pretty much it if we compile and save that trigger and then put that in the world and then open our controller back up and just get rid of that begin dialog and compile and save when i hit play let's try it out if we walk up to our trigger you can see it begins the dialog hi i'm rick and we can say how are you rick and now it actually works the other thing i'll do is i'll open that dialog trigger up go to the event graph right click on dialog and make it a variable and then click the little eye there and what that'll let you do is if you make any dialogues in the future you'll be able to select the dialogue you actually want to play um, so let's go back into our rick dialogue and I'll just show you the basics of the dialogue editor. It's, it's pretty simple to use. So um, let's add another player response. We'll say, uh, heard any rumors? And we'll add another one. Goodbye. And you can see this is really easy to use. Feel free to explore and add whatever dialogue you want here. I'm just going to say, heard any rumors? Uh, I have not. <laughs> I can't think of anything funny for him to say. And then, how are you, Rick? We'll just say, I'm just swell, partner. <laughs> I guess he's a southerner. And the next thing we're going to do is, well, we could try that out, but I want to show you a cool little technique you can do here. So um, if I hold Alt and click, I can actually disconnect the pins here. And I'm going to use another empty node. And uh, you'll, you'll see here why these empty nodes are quite useful. So if we add a line for Rick and leave it empty, what we can do here, I'll just show you this, you can actually add something called a backlink. And so if I backlink like that, if I ask any of these, it'll come back here and then I'll be able to choose these options again. I'll hook that one up too. So let me show you what I mean here. This is quite useful because in a game, often you want to be able to ask multiple different questions. So it says, hi, I'm Rick. How are you, Rick? I'm just swell, partner. And you can see I can ask the questions again. You'll also notice it says Ruben Blade, like it says a really ugly name. If you're playing a multiplayer game, it'll actually say your username. It's because I'm playing this in the editor that it gives me that bad name. But I do want to show you how to change that if you don't like that. What you can do is stop the simulation, go to plugins, narrative content, narrative UI, widgets, open the default UI up, and we're just going to modify it. Just go into the graph and there's this function get player name. You can see it just grabs your username. But if you wanted to hard code it, like say your character's name was Rubes, for example, you could just put in Rubes. If you compile and save, it will say Rubes. Now, if I go up and talk to the other character, you can see it says Rubes now. And this is really good to know. You can actually uh, change a lot of the stuff in the UI. If you come into the designer, you can change the layout of the UI. You can change the code, completely change how it works if you want. You can even copy the code and use it for your own UI if you want to modify it. Um, the UI is pretty simple to change, especially if you're just changing like colors and things like that. You'll notice that Narrative knows to aim the camera at this guy. It knows that this is Rick. That's because when we begin the dialogue, it asks for a default NPC avatar, and by default it just plugs in self. And Narrative knows that there's a skeletal mesh, and it knows that the skeletal mesh has a head, and it aims at the head. And so that's how it's aiming the camera so far. Things get a little bit trickier when we add multiple speakers, so I want to explain how that works. If I open up Rick, I uh, might add another character if i go to class defaults i can add another character right if i click add to speakers i can add another character called for example larry and i'm going to give larry a different color i'm going to make him green and now you can see if i drag out you can add a dialogue line for rick or larry right you can choose any of your speakers and so um if i say heard any rumors uh, let's disconnect this one so rick says i have not let's drag out and we'll add a line for Larry and we'll say, I have, I heard, <laughs> I heard Rick smells. And then we'll add a line for Rick. We'll be like, shut up, Larry. And then we can add our backlink again.
I had to mention this because I finished recording this video and I remember I didn't mention this, but you can actually use ChatGPT to generate dialogue. So if I say, uh, generate a conversation between two characters, Rick and Larry. So ChatGPT is giving me an absurd, I mean, this is so much dialogue. So you can tell ChatGPT, can you make it more short and it will do that for you. But let's just copy and paste this. So narrative actually supports writing your dialogue in a text file and then you can paste it right in. So I'm going to copy this. All you have to do is have the character's name and then a colon and then what they're saying. So that's the format narrative takes and that's how ChatGPT actually gives you dialogue. So if I copy that and paste it in, look at that. I do have to sort of drag these out a little bit because I think there's so much content here. But you can see that you can generally paste these massive bits of dialogue right in from ChatGPT. It's just brought this right into the editor. So you can create a lot of dialogue really quickly if you want to. If we compile and save, the problem is there's just one character, right? We need multiple different characters and there's a couple of ways to do that. Option number one is you can go into the class defaults here and you can select an avatar class and tell it where it should be and narrative will spawn the avatar in and it will aim the camera at the avatar that's a little bit more annoying to have to do so let me show you the simpler way i'm going to open that dialogue trigger up and i will literally just copy that skeletal mesh and we'll add another blueprint actor this time i'm going to call this bp underscore dialogue avatar now we're just going to come in here and we're going to paste that mesh in so a dialogue avatar is literally just a mesh that's it and if we put one of them in the level here, in fact, we're going to need two of them because there's Rick and Larry, two different characters. And what I'll do is I'll open my dialogue trigger back up and we can get rid of that mesh. We don't need it anymore. So the easiest way to do it is if you already have your characters in the level, then you can go to tags and add a tag and literally just add the tag Rick. And then for the other one, I'll add the tag Larry. And this is how narrative knows who to aim the camera at, right? And so if I try this out now, this should actually work fine. So we'll run up to our dialogue trigger. Hi, I'm Rick. We say, heard any rumors? I have not. And then Larry's gonna say, I have, I heard Rick smells. <laughs> Shut up, Larry. And so this is quite an easy way to do it. And you can color the characters um, differently as well. If you go into your dialogue avatar, we'll go to the construction script, drag our mesh in, we will create a dynamic material instance, and we will promote it to a variable. We'll say body mat, and then we will set vector parameter value, and then simply type in tint, right click on value, and we'll rename that to body color and click the little I here, compile, save. And now what you should be able to do is actually click on your characters and you can give them different colors, right? So I could make one of them red and I can make one of them blue. And obviously in a real game, you could give them different meshes or different art. This is just a really basic example, right? And so um, we call this process linking, right? Narrative needs to know which avatar to aim the camera at. And one of the ways of linking the right speaker up to their correct avatar is by using these tags. But you can also do it um, by having narrative spawn them in. I am going to show you how to do it the other way as well. So we'll right click on dialogue avatar and we'll make a child. So we'll say dialogue avatar underscore Rick. And I'm just going to copy that color and just paste it in here. So we've got Rick now as his own blueprint. And if we come into the dialogue, click on class defaults and go to Rick. Under speaker avatar class, search for Rick and then select that as his dialogue avatar. And now I'm going to copy his location and under speaker avatar transform, I'm gonna paste that in. Same thing for his rotation come in here and we'll set his rotation as well. 
if we compile and save, we can now get rid of his character from the level. And what Narrative will do is it'll spawn it in for us and it will clean it up when the dialogue finishes. So check this out. If I run up to him, you can see it spawns his character in, points it at him. If I end the dialogue, it will despawn his character. And this is really useful because sometimes you do want dialogues to just be instanced and be managed for you by narrative. You don't necessarily want your characters already in the level all the time. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. All right, so I'm gonna put Rick back in the level. I'm gonna undo what I did, come back into my dialogue and I'll just clear that, right? So it's no longer gonna spawn in Rick because I don't have a class set for him and it'll use this one instead. So I'm going back to the old way of doing it. Now, if either of those options, if you don't want it to spawn it and you don't wanna use the tags, you wanna do your own custom way, you can always override the link speaker avatar class and write whatever code you want, um, but that's a little bit more advanced. Next up, we need to talk about dialogue shots. So by default, Narrative has a camera shot where it points the, um, the camera at the person talking. And you'll notice it also sort of keeps us to the left side of the screen and it keeps the NPCs on the other side of the screen. And this is a cinematography rule that Narrative automatically follows for you. But you might wanna change the shot. This is not necessarily the best shot to use. So if we close this and open up our dialogue, for example, um, shut up Larry, right? If Rick's really mad, we can change the dialogue shot for him. And you can do that by going to shot and select the speaker shot. And then this is the offset, right? This is the forward and backwards. This is left and right. So I'm gonna put it right in front of his face and don't tilt the camera. And we'll compile and save and watch what happens when Rick says shut up Larry, the camera's gonna be right up in his face, right? Cause he's mad. And so you can change the dialogue shot. I'll show you. Heard any rumors? I have not. I heard Rick's mouths and shut up Larry, right? So you can change that dialogue shot. If you go to class defaults as well, under dialogue shots, the reason it uses that one out of the box is because it's added in there. You can add more shots if you want to randomize it. So for example, I could add an over the shoulder shot and it would use that sometimes as well. It'll just randomly select one of those shots. So check this out. Just adds a bit more variation. You can see this is an over the shoulder shot. Um, if I say I heard any rumors, you can see it's kind of randomizing the shots a little bit. So that can be a cool effect. You can even go into the speaker and you could say every time Rick is speaking, I want it to be an over the shoulder shot. I'll get rid of the over shoulder shot down here. We'll compile and save. And now it'll use that speaker shot, but it'll override it. Whenever Rick speaks, he'll have an over the shoulder shot. You can see Rick speaks, it's over to the shoulder. And if anyone else speaks, it won't be over the shoulder. But if you override the shot for a given line, it will override the speaker shot. So there's kind of an order of precedence, right? It'll use the lines shot first, it will use the speaker shot second, and then it will fall back to these dialogue shots last. I've also forgotten to mention, you can actually turn off the cinematic dialogue camera by checking that box there. And if we compile and save, watch what happens. It actually doesn't spawn in a cine cam at all. Sometimes in a game, you actually want that. Um, but I think the cinematic shots are pretty cool. I tend to leave it on. There's also this option. If you check the box that says free movement, that actually lets you move around while the dialogue is playing. And this is really cool. You see this a lot of games like GTA where, um, you know, you'll have a conversation with a person while you walk down the street. Generally speaking, you don't want to have any dialogue options come up on the screen though, because you're not going to have a mouse cursor. And that brings me to the next feature, which is auto select. So whenever a player line comes up, what you want to do, if you don't want the player to have to select it, if you click on this and go to auto select, what this will do is it'll just select the line automatically. This is really good for free movement shots. You can see here, heard any rumors? I have not. Right, so it's automatically playing it instead of me having to select it. So I'm gonna come back in here and uncheck auto select. And you wouldn't want a backlink for an auto select, by the way, because it's just gonna keep playing this forever. Um, but I wanna show you one other thing. Um, so for example, say the player says like, heard any rumors, you guys must no something that's quite a long line of dialogue right and so this is where option text comes in if you select um heard any rumors as the option text 
So I'll just turn free movement off and spawn dialog camera back on and I'll just show you that as well. So we'll hit play. Hi, I'm Rick. And if we say, you can see it says heard any rumors, right? This is the option text. We've selected heard any rumors, but your player will actually say a different line of dialogue. Another thing you can do if you click on the player line here, you can add alternative lines of dialogue. So heard any rumors, you guys must know something. Heard any rumors, lol. <laughs> what, what, what this will do is it will randomly select one of the lines you've provided. So if you provide more lines, it'll add a bit of randomization. Um, I won't show you that because it's kind of self-explanatory. Now, here's something that I really want to get into is the event graph, right? Dialogues can have blueprint code in them because they are just blueprints, right? And one of the easiest ways to do this, say you want to execute a little bit of code, is, you know, imagine, um, you know, if I ask Rick how he is, we could say here, have a gold coin, right? Say we want Rick to give our character a gold coin. Well, what you could do is you could actually double click on this node here and you can get the owning, you know, controller and you can like give them a coin or whatever. Obviously we don't have any coin system in our project or anything like that, but you could do that. Um, as an example, I'll just say like print string, give coin. So this is a nice little event that gets called for you whenever this line of dialogue um, starts or ends and you can check whether it's started or ended using this here. So I'll just say on started for example compile and save and check it out it's going to say give coin when rick says his line of dialogue how are you rick you can see it says give coin you'll also notice that it has this little lightning bolt here that means that it has an event bound to it if you want to remove the event all you have to do is hold shift and then click and then it will remove the bound event the um, event will still be there but it won't get called anymore and you can delete it if you want to while these events might sound really awesome you actually won't use these very often because there's a better system. You can actually uh, add events down here. And these are generally a lot more versatile and you'll use these a lot more. There's actually a few that come with narrative. For example, you can begin a quest. Um, you know, for example, let's say I'm just swell partner. Um, here's a quest. Help me find my lost gold coin. And then you could actually automatically begin a quest. We haven't gotten into quests yet, but if you did make a quest, you could kick a quest off. There's also a runtime. This lets you control whether you want to begin that quest when he starts talking or when he finishes the dialogue line. So you can choose when, or you can even do both if you want. But events are very versatile. Yeah, there's these ones that come with narrative, but you can write your own events. For example, you can make an event that adds an item to the player's inventory. Let me show you how to do that really quick because it's pretty important. You will do this a lot in narrative. So I'm going to make a new folder. I'll just call it events and I will go in there, go to narrative, make a new narrative event. I'll call it NE underscore give item or something like that. In your event, you need to override execute event. And obviously I don't have an item system in my game. So I'm just going to do a print string and I'll right click on this and do um, item name. Compile and save. And then there's another function you want to override called get graph display text. And I'll show you how this works. We'll do um, append string. I'm going to plug this in. And I'm going to type give item. And then drag item name in and connect it up like that. And what that does is I'll show you if I compile that and go back into my Rick dialog. So say Rick is going to give us a gold coin, right? So we'll say um, I'm doing swell. Here's a gold coin. We can go to events and we can use that custom one we just made, give item. And it's saying um, give item, I'm gonna do give item coin. And check it out. So now it actually says on the UI, give item coin. Um, and so that's why we had to do that get graph display text thing. And so um, check it out, right? If I do this, if I hit play, and I say, how are you Rick? He says, here's a gold coin. You can see it says coin up the top. Obviously in your game, instead of just putting coin on the screen, you would actually add the coin to the player's inventory. So really cool. And by the way, this return value doesn't actually matter for events. It's just a thing that's left in there from older versions of narrative. So it doesn't matter whether you return true or not.
So events are pretty cool, but conditions are even cooler. So I want to show you how these work. So let's go to um, Rick here and we'll add another player line and we'll say um, thanks for the coin. You're going to use this all the time. These conditions are so, so useful. So um, say that Rick gives us a gold coin, right? We want to say thanks for the coin, but we only want that to come up as an option if he's actually given us a gold coin, right? And this is where conditions come in. So if I click on this, I can add a condition. One of the conditions that comes with narrative, obviously you can make your own just like we did with the coin, um, but one of the conditions that comes with narrative is this one, has dialogue node played? This one's so useful. And so this lets you check if a dialogue line's ever played. So if this line's ever played, we want to be able to say thanks, right? So we just come over to this line here, we copy this ID, and then we just paste in, if we come down to node ID, just paste that in there. And you can see it says here, has dialogue node Rick, I'm just swell partner played one times, right? So if this is played one time, then we can select this. And you can do as many as you want. You can do five times or whatever, but we'll just do one. And we'll have Rick say, uh, no worries. And then we'll go back. You can see these backlinks are starting to get a little bit messy, by the way. Um, one technique for cleaning these up is if I hold Alt and delete all of these, um, you can just do an empty node, right? Hook these all up and then you can just have one backlink instead of having a bunch. Sort of up to you how you do it. Another thing is with these empty nodes, um, sometimes you don't want them to be massive like this and you can check this box that um, makes them into a nice little neat node. Um, it's just kind of a style thing. Here's another one. I can make this a nice little tiny node. And if you click on it, you can um, undo that if you ever want to. Okay, a little thing I forgot to mention. For your reroute node, just use a player node and check auto select and use that to route backwards. Um, I'll explain at the end of the video why you need to do that because it's kind of complicated and not that important. But if you really want to work with this plugin and know everything. I'll put that at the end. Uh, but just use a player node and uh, let's try it out. So, how are you? Here's a gold coin. And now it says, thanks for the coin, right? We can actually select that option. It doesn't show up until he's given me the coin. Also in narrative, this is a feature that I didn't have turned on before, but it will gray out any replies you've selected out of the box. You don't have to do anything. It should just do this right away. Okay, so now I'm going to show you why I left that um, first node empty. And the reason is because Rick might need to say lots of different things, right? Imagine you're doing a quest with Rick. Well, if you're doing a quest with Rick, he should probably ask you how the quest's going, right? So I could say, uh, how is the quest going? But then narrative doesn't know which line to play, right? Should it play, hi, I'm Rick, or should it play, how's the quest going? We need to select the right one. And to do that, the easiest way is to use a condition. So for example, if, if there was a quest, you could add a condition. And there's actually one that comes with narrative called is quest in progress. And you can select one of your quests that you've made. And I'll get into that later. Um, and then, you know, it would select this. And narrative goes from top to bottom. So if there's a routing node here, it'll say, it'll try this one first. And if the quest's in progress, it'll, he'll say that. But if the quest wasn't in progress, he'll come down and say this instead. So you can use these conditions to select certain options or filter out different player options, right? And another thing is that quests can get, or sorry, dialogues can get really messy. Um, you can see there's quite a lot of dialogue just here on its own. Um, and so you might often like to make sub dialogues and I'll show you how to do that. So let's go to our Rick dialogue and I'm going to hit control D to duplicate it. And I'm going to call this Rick underscore uh, greet, something like that, right? And we'll go into the dialogue graph and we'll delete this bit and we'll just leave that, right? We just want this bit and we'll come back in here and I'll delete all of this. And instead of saying, hi, I'm Rick, I'll just leave it empty. But this time I will go to events and use the begin dialogue event that comes with narrative. And we will start the Rick greet dialogue. And now what it's going to do is it's basically made a sub dialogue, right? And this is a great way to organize your dialogues into nice, neat little packages. 
So if I save, compile and save both of those and try it out, hopefully that should work. Ah, uh, it does say, how's the quest going? If I delete that one, we'll just use this as an example. You can see it starts that sub dialogue, right? And this is great. Like if you've got a main character, they might have like 20 different dialogues. So it's a great idea to package them up. And then you would have like their main dialogue here. It would select, you know, the right sub dialogue based on whether you're doing a quest for them or, or a number of other things. Okay, so I, the next thing I want to talk about is targets. So lines can actually be targeted towards someone. So for example, Larry says, I heard Rick smells, right? And then Rick says, shut up, Larry. You can actually make it so that that line is directed at Larry. It will show up on the UI there. The reason you'd want to do that is the certain um, shots, like for example, the over the shoulder shot, it needs to know who the line's directed at to line the shot up correctly. And so it's sometimes nice to fill that out. Also, if you're ever making a game where the characters need to look at each other, you need to set that so that you can figure out who's talking at who, right? A little bit more of a complex feature and you really don't have to use it, especially not all the time because um, Narrative will try and figure out who the line's directed at by default and you can see how it does that here if you hover over this. A little bit more of an advanced feature, it's really just there if you need it. Alright, next feature I'm going to show you, we're going to go into D Rick Greet and we're going to click on Rick and instead of saying I'm just Swell Partner, I want him to actually say the player's name. So I'm going to show you how to use dialog variables. So we're going to do curly brackets and then inside I'm going to do uh, player name. Compile and save. We'll jump into the event graph here and override, uh, where is it, get string variable. And then switch on the variable name and we'll just plug that in like that. We'll add a case. I believe I called it player name. Yes, yeah, so we're going to come in here and we're going to type player name. And then what we'll do is we will get the owning controller, get the player state, and we'll grab the player's username. All right, so get player name, plug that in, plug that in. Now what's going to happen? is instead of saying I'm just swell and then, you know, partner, it's actually going to say the player's name. This is quite cool. Um, it's particularly in games where you don't have audio. This is a really nice thing to be able to do. So if you say, how are you, uh, Rick? I'm just swell. And then it inserts the player's username. Very cool. Now there's a feature that I haven't shown you so far, and you really should use this, and you should do this for all of your dialogues in your game is you should actually make a master dialogue class. And the reason is for that. You know how I just wrote that code there? Well, if I ever make a new blueprint, right? If I ever make a new dialogue, I'll call it D underscore Larry. And if I try to make Larry do the same thing, right? Hi there, brackets, player name. It's not gonna work because I wrote the code inside of my D Rick greet class and Larry is not gonna be able to use that same code unless I write that code again right? And anyone who codes, this is not the right way to do it. Um, and the answer is that generally speaking in your game, you should make a dialogue called D underscore, you know, master or something like that. And put all of your code in your master dialogue. So I'm going to do that actually. Let's copy my get string variable and I'll paste it in there instead. Yeah, uh, hang on. Right, so I'll put it in here instead, and then inside of Rick Greet, go to class settings, and set the parent class to be your master dialogue. And anytime you make a new blueprint, just right click on master and create a child blueprint, right? And I'll do the same, D underscore Larry, or D underscore Nicholas, whatever you want it to be. And now the code's in your master blueprint, and they'll all be able to do this, right? You can even go to edit project settings and set your default dialogue class to your master one. And this way, anytime you make a new dialogue, you can see the parent class is D master right out of the box by default. 
And so I'd really highly recommend setting up sort of a master dialogue class. And that way any code you write will be shared across all of your dialogues. All right, so now you've done all this, it's actually really easy to add the metahumans. Adding the lip sync and the metahumans is actually the easy part. It's not very hard at all. So let's add some metahumans to our dialogue. So we're going to go to the uh, plus thing here and open up Quixel Bridge, which comes with Unreal Engine. And then we're going to go to the metahumans tab. We're going to go to metahuman presets and then just select any of these metahumans. It doesn't really matter what one you go for. I'm going to use Gavin here, so I'll click on that. And... Seems like I have to do highest quality, so I'm going to do highest quality and then click on download. Okay, so I'm just going to use one metahuman for this example. I've downloaded one metahuman, Gavin, and I'm going to click on add to add him to the project. It's going to do all sorts of stuff. It will also tell you to enable a bunch of uh, things that it needs, so we'll do that. You will have to restart, but we won't do that immediately. I don't think it's that important. But um, if you go to the metahumans folder now, you'll have Gavin in here. And if you drag BP Gavin into the level, uh, oh, we might actually have to restart our project. So let's do that. It's also telling me to enable shader model six. Uh, I don't know how important it is to actually do that, but I will do that anyway. So we're going to go to edit project settings. We're going to go to platforms, windows. And check this box that says SM6. Oh, we got to restart again. All right, so I'm going to restart again. Okay, so we've restarted the project now. And if we come in here, we're going to have to change our dialogue avatars a bit. Because if we open up BP Gavin, this MetaHuman that's now in our project, it'll be in the MetaHuman's Gavin folder. You'll notice that there's lots of different pieces. So there's a body, there's a torso, there's pants, and so on. Um, so we're going to definitely be modifying some things. Um, so let's go into our dialogue avatar. Here we've got a dialogue avatar class and we're definitely going to have to modify this quite a lot. So I'm going to rename, in fact, I'll just delete the skeletal mesh from my dialogue avatar. So we'll get rid of that. And then we'll start to copy some of these in. So we're going to copy over the body. We're going to copy over, in fact, we might be able to do these all in one go. I'm not going to do the hair. These can be kind of uh, annoying. Feel free to copy the hair over if you want. I'm going to leave that. Um, so we'll paste that over and we'll select. Hmm. For some reason it didn't do the feet properly. I'm going to delete that. Let's try the feet again. It's calling them skeletal mesh for some reason. I'm just going to rename those to feet. And um, attach these all to the body like this. And then we'll click on the body. And we'll use the rotate tool again, make sure that he's actually facing forward. So I'm going to point him in the direction of the X. There we go. Compile and save. Let's come into a dialogue avatar and what's going on here? Ah, yes, this old dynamic material instance doesn't matter anymore. We'll get rid of that. All right, we'll click on Gavin. We're going to go into Gavin and don't do anything to the face, I don't think. But we will go to skeleton, assign. And we're going to select, we're going to select this one here. SK mannequin, 157 kilobytes. Um, or roundabout, should be about that size. And we'll accept and click OK. We're going to take all of these clothing pieces. I think that's all of them. And then again, we're going to do the same thing. Skeleton, assign skeleton. We're going to click on the same one. Accept. Let's do that as many times as we need. Okay. Again, same one. Accept, save. All right, back into the dialogue avatar. We're going to go to the body. We're going to go to use anim asset. And we're going to try and use the mm idol. All right. Almost there, almost there. Inside of the construction script, we're going to take all of these, drag them in, and then drag in the body. Set, uh, I think it's called the leader pose component. Plug all of these in. Oh, sorry, my bad. Plug them all into here. Plug the body into there. Uh...
my bad, I just have to hook that up again. Uh, we'll check both of these just to be safe. Cool, okay, there we go. So you can see now our animation setup is working. So all we had to do is just make sure our metahuman can use the old character's animation. So that's why we had to do all that annoying stuff. But anyways, now we should actually be able to use our dialogue. Now they do have uh, different color shirts. They look the exact same. I I'll, I'll add another metahuman later, I think, but let's just try this out, make sure this actually works. Hi, I'm Rick. How are you, Rick? Looks pretty good. Seems to be working okay. Larry's working fine. They look a bit terrifying without any hair, but you get the idea. You can add the hair if you want. If you really want the hair, just copy and paste the hairs over and add the lod sync component as well. All right, time to set up LiveLink. First thing to do is open up a command prompt and then type in uh, ipconfig. I'm going to blur this out, but you're looking for the IPv4 address. So you need to get that, take a screenshot, copy and paste it, do whatever you need to, but just remember that IP. Next, you want to download the LiveLink app on the App Store for iOS and then go into LiveLink and add a target and then put in your IP. And I've called mine Rube's iPhone. Okay, so once you've done the setup on the iPhone, we're going to put this BP Gavin in the level. And it actually comes with a bit of uh, code on it already for the LiveLink setup. It's already set up to do LiveLink. You should be able to find your um, iPhone in the drop down. If you've set up the app correctly, it should work. If that isn't working, there's plenty of tutorials. I may have left something out, but I'm pretty sure that's all you need to do. Click on uh, LiveLink face, click on Rube's iPhone. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the um, app on my phone and check it out. He should be lip syncing. There we go. Yeah. Uh, there's another toggle for doing the head rotation. We're not going to do head rotation today, but you can see mine's turned on. And what we need to do is record these animations so that our characters can use them. And it's actually really, really easy to do. So let me show you how to do that. We're going to go to uh, Window, Cinematics, Take Recorder. And we can use the Take Recorder to record audio and animations. It's really cool how you can do this. It's so easy. So we're going to add microphone audio because obviously I want to record my audio. And then we're also going to record... Um, Gavin. So make sure that Gavin's selected in the level. You can see he's got that highlight around him. And then just click on Gavin. Now, this is where things get a little bit hairy, but we only really want to record my face. It's going to record a bunch. You can delete the body and the legs and stuff, and it makes it a little bit less bulky. There's a lot of, a little bit less data that it's recording. Um, but I'm just going to keep them all just because I'm showing you this as an example. So let's just record one of these lines, right? Hi, I'm Rick. Just as an example, I'll show you how to do this. All right, so I'm going to uh, record a line. So you ready? Let's do it. Hi, I'm Rick. So you can see what I did. I just clicked the record button. And then um, when it's time to finish, I hit the stop recording. And you can see it's saving it to game slash takes. I believe if we go to the content browser takes here it is hi i'm rick there's the audio and you can see the face gets recorded this one here there it is there right so obviously you can do as many recordings as you want if you delete the torso you won't get all these annoying animations um, but i'm gonna rename this to a underscore hi i'm rick I'm going to right click on it and make a animontage. So go to create animontage. And I'll call this s underscore hi I'm Rick. If we open up our Rick dialog, we'll go into Rick greet. And here's the hi I'm Rick line. And I'm going to search for it. Hi I'm Rick. We're going to go to the dialog montage and select hi I'm Rick. Just a couple more minor steps here. All right, so here's our head. Our head's going to play animations, but if we play animations on the head, it's not going to sync up with the body. So we're going to do a little bit more coding to get that to work. I'm going to browse to the uh, face anim BP asset. Just find that. Should be in the metahumans folder here. And we're going to make a new anim blueprint. So we're going to go to animation, anim blueprint. We're going to go to, uh, what is it called? Face archetype skeleton. Going to create, I'm going to call it 
uh, NMBP underscore lip sync. Something like that. Open it up. Sorry if it sounds like I'm kind of winging this, by the way, guys. I sort of am. But I promise this will work. We'll get this working. So we'll go into event update blueprint animation. We will get the owning actor. And the owning actor will be a dialogue avatar. So we'll cast a dialogue avatar. And we'll get the body of our character. So get body. And we will store this in a variable. We'll just store it in body. Okay, what you want to do now is go into your anim graph, drag the body in, we're going to use this copy pose from mesh node, and then save that, I'm going to give us a better name by the way, we'll call it body pose. Then what you want to do is uh, use cached pose body pose. We're going to do a layered blend per bone here. Uh, okay, this is going to be kind of annoying, but bear with me here, okay? For your layer setup, go to branch filters, add three branch filters, okay? First one, facial underscore C underscore facial root. These are names of bones, by the way. Uh, facial underscore C underscore neck to root. Facial underscore c underscore deck one root this is really annoying but you'll only have to do this once so we will hook that up and then yeah i think that's fine we'll do slot default slot let's just try this i think this should work so um we're going to improve this we'll make it even cooler in a little bit but i just want to make sure this works so far so okay we have rick great we've selected our montage selected our sound um, go back into your dialogue avatar, click on the head, and make sure he's using the, that NMBP lip sync that we made. Compile. Save. All right, let's try this out. This is the moment of truth, guys. Oh, my God. And we'll go into the master dialogue, because we're going to write some code. So you really want a master dialogue, because any dialogues you write in the future, you want them to have this code that we're about to write. So make sure you do that master step I showed you earlier. And what we're going to do is we're going to override play dialogue animation. By default, the editor will try play any animations you've selected, but it doesn't know whether to play them on the body or the face or whatever. And we want to play them on the face, right? So what we want to do is go to speaker, cast to dialogue avatar, get the face, play montage, and then hook up the montage, which is located in the dialogue line that we're trying to play. So there we go. Compile, save. Okay, we're going to go into our dialogue avatar, unhook face from set leader pose component. We no longer want to do the face. We just want to do the torso, feet, and the legs. I think that's what the issue is here. So we'll compile and save. All right, this is our last Hail Mary. Hopefully this works now. Hi, I'm Rick. There we go. Yes. All right. It's finally using our facial animations. So that's all you have to do. It is quite a lot. Once you have a good setup though, like a few little tweaks and um, it, it can be really quick to spam out animations. You can actually do them quite quickly. Um, obviously getting that setup is really annoying, but once you have it set up, it's honestly pretty easy to work with. It's really just that setup process that's so awful. I'm going to leave a link in the description to the narrative content examples, by the way, and that comes with a MetaHuman player as well. I'm not going to show you how to make the player into a MetaHuman as well in this video, just because it's kind of a little bit too much outside of the scope. This is more about showing you how to use narrative. But yeah, the link will be in the description for that, and you can see for yourself how to do that. In your dialogue avatars, by the way, you should still be able to change the color of the shirt. If we take the torso, plug it in like this. Right, it's actually diffuse underscore color underscore one. We'll do that again. Let's come back in here, compile and save. There we go. Okay, so now you can use this body color and give them at least different color shirts. But obviously, if you add more metahumans into the game, then you can like change out their clothing and faces and things like that. But because this is an example, I think the best way to tell them apart is just to change the color of their shirts at the moment. They kind of look like the Wiggles. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick. So cool how easy it is to get that setup going though. Like, we must be less than an hour in so far. 
Okay, so quests. Let's go ahead and go to the quests folder. And quests are very simple to create. We just right click, go to narrative and make a new quest blueprint. You can see it says a special type of blueprint that includes a node based quest editor. So I like to call it Q underscore and then the name of your quest. But it's a really good idea to set up a master class that all of your quests are going to use, right? So um, I'm just going to call this master quest. So once we've made that master quest, let's actually make our first quest now. So we're going to create a child blueprint class and I'm going to call this Q underscore my first quest. And we will open that up and I'm going to change the name to my first quest. And you can put a little description in if you want. I'm not going to do that at the moment. We'll compile and save. And the quest blueprint is exactly like any blueprint you've ever used, except it also comes with a quest designer. The quest editor is a little intimidating at first, but it's actually really, really easy to use. So these gray nodes are states, and you can add states by right-clicking and adding a state. And a state is just a certain point at the quest you can be at. So let's say that an NPC tells you that you have to go and find him a ancient trophy and bring it back to him, right? Well, quest start is where you'd be at the start of the quest, and then once you find the trophy, you might be at this new state called found trophy, right? But you can't just hook a state up to a state. The way that you move through the quest is by completing tasks, right? You have to find the trophy. That's how you get to this state in the quest. And so this brings me to branches. So if we drag out, there's a whole bunch of these tasks that actually come with narrative. And there's this one called go to location. So these are like things that the player has to do. And you'll be making your own tasks, and I'm going to show you how to do that later. But here's one that comes with narrative called go to location. You can see when you click one of your tasks, it actually automatically adds a state for you to save you having to do this yourself. So I'll delete this one and we'll come into quest state two and I'll say went to cube. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that the player just has to run over to this cube over here, just as an example, right? So we'll click on this cube here. I'm going to copy the location of the cube. I'll come into my quest tasks. I'll expand this go to location and then for the goal location, I'll just paste in the location of the cube. It even takes this friendly location name. You can see it says go to location name here. If I was to change this to the cube, you can see it now says go to the cube, right? So let me just show you this actually working. We'll compile our quest and save it. And if I come into my narrative PC, my narrative player controller, if we drag narrative in, and drag out and search for begin quest, we can begin that quest that we just made. And we'll select my first quest and it's gonna begin that quest and because the UI is on the screen, it will actually show us the quest as well. So we're gonna hit play. You can see it says go to the cube. But if I run over to the cube, you can see that it's completed that step. Now there's no new tasks in our quest. The quest is essentially finished at this point because we need to add more stuff to it. And so we'll go back into our quest and I just want to demonstrate. So this is a state. A state's a point you can be at at the quest, but there's these special types of states. If I hold alt and click, there is the succeed the quest and fail the quest states. And these are just states. However, they don't have an output pin. And this is because the quest is over at this point, right? Once you get here, um, we'll call this quest complete, for example. We could even give it, a, give it a description. We could say I've completed the quest, right? So once you get to a green state, you've succeeded the quest. If you go to a red state, you've failed the quest, right? So for example, you can make a quest where going to the cube will succeed the quest. And, you know, if you did some other thing, let's just use go to location again. I'll delete this one. Hook up to the fail here. Let's say if you go to the wrong cube, let's say if you go to this cube, it actually fails the quest. So I'm going to move that over a little bit and copy that location. I'll paste that in like that. Again, we'll just say the cube, or let's let's say the wrong cube. And we'll say uh, quest failed. Oh no, I've failed the quest. A lot of these descriptions and things don't really matter, um, but they're really nice for the UI. For example, I'll show you later, there's a quest journal you can use and it uses these descriptions. All right, so here's our little quest and I'll just show you if I play this now, It's got two branches on the screen, right? Go to the cube or go to the wrong cube. And so if we go to the cube, 
you can see it says quest succeeded up the top and this quest has actually now succeeded. And if we go to the wrong cube, it should say quest failed and it does. Generally speaking, you wouldn't want to actually tell the player to go to the wrong cube, right? That doesn't actually make much sense. And so you can actually click on your uh, branch here and you can click hidden and you see it says this little icon here this branch is hidden and won't show up and so now if i hit play it actually won't say go to the wrong cube it'll just say go to the cube so you can have ways of failing the quest that don't actually show up in the ui another thing that you can do is you can have multiple tasks that the player needs to complete so let's actually uh, click on this one here i'm going to hold shift and right click to copy this and i will add and then shift left click to paste right and instead of saying the wrong cube i'll just say the other cube and we'll get rid of this bit so you can actually have multiple tasks on a branch so i'll save that and now if i hit play you can see i need to go to both of the cubes to complete this quest step right and i can do them in any order and so another cool thing is you can actually make tasks optional so for example go to the cube and then go to the other cube if I go to the other cube task and I check this box that says optional, you can see it actually says optional here. And what that means is I don't actually have to go to the other cube. Um, I can do that step if I want, but if I just go to the main cube, um, it will complete the quest. You can see it says quest succeeded. Even though I didn't do the optional task, it doesn't matter. It still completed the quest. Likewise, you can see if I complete the optional step, Right, it doesn't actually complete the quest. I have to go and uh, do the main task. Tasks also auto-generate these descriptions, right? You can see it says like, go to the cube, go to the other cube. Well, it's auto-generating that depending on what I type in as the location name, and I'll, I'll go more into that later. Uh, but if you don't like that, you can override these descriptions. If you go to description override, you can be like, go to the cube, man. You know, if you want to say something different, if I use the description override, compile and save my quest and try it, you can see it says, go to the cube, man. So you can put whatever you want for the task names. If you wanted to make it so that the player had to go to the cubes in a certain order, really easy to do as well. I'm gonna copy this and I will drag out, add another state, and then I'll add another go to location. And then I'll just paste in my other go to location like this and we will get rid of that second one so you should have go to the cube and then go to the other cube right and so if you compile and save this now we've essentially made a quest where you have to go to this cube first and then you have to go to the other cube right so you have to do the tasks in a certain order and although so far we're just keeping it really simple by making it go to the cube, in a real game this would be kill an enemy and find an item and all that sort of stuff. And you can make really rich, crazy quests, right? You can make a quest where once I'm at this step, I could fail the quest. You know, I'll just I'll just wing it and give you a little example here. Like I could fail the quest, but or maybe I want it so that I might fail the quest, um, but you can still redeem yourself and succeed the quest. Um, but if you don't redeem yourself, um, you know, you can fail the quest, right? So you can see how you can make really like crazy non-linear um, non quests, right? You can make really complex quests with multiple different endings, multiple different ways to complete the quest. And this might be a little confusing um, at the start, but this is very intuitive. Uh, trust me, you'll get used to this in no time. You can see it says like quest state 6 and quest branch 11. It just shows the ID. So, you know, you might actually want to give this a better ID, like go to cube. Um, and then here you might say go to cube 2. So you can like give these better names if you want, or you can just leave them as these defaults. So I'll delete all of this messiness and we'll just go back to, let's just go back to a nice simple quest, right? Let's just plug that in like that. Something that you've probably noticed by now is that when you open up your quest, there's not really a lot of tasks the player can do. In a real game, right, the player might have to find an item or kill a character to move through a quest, and those don't exist. So how do you make custom tasks? Well, that's a great question. Let's do it. You'll be doing this a lot in your game, right? And you don't have to make many of them. If you think of a game like Skyrim, most of the quests are like, find this item, then talk to this character, then kill this boss, and that's the quest done, right? So you really only have to make a few of them. And so let's do a really common one, which is find an item, right? Let's make it so you have to find an item to complete your quest. And so 
we're going to come into our quest here and if we right click we can go to narrative and make a new task right and you can see it says tasks are blueprints that manage a task for the player to complete and so if i add my task i'm going to call it bpt underscore find item right that's the task so you've got to find an item and now i'm going to save everything and open my quest back up and check it out if i drag out i can actually make find item a task in my quest how cool is that but we actually have to write a bit of code to make it do something it won't work just yet and you can also see that it says uncategorized and it's got a bit of an ugly name so we'll fix that as well we'll come into our task and we'll go to the class settings and give it a nice name so find item the description i'm going to say task that completes when the player finds the given item and for the category i'll just do like items and so now you can see in the quest designer if you drag out it's under that nice items category now so it looks very nice and so what we'll do is we'll come into our narrative player controller here and you, you could obviously implement an item system a number of different ways. Every game's going to be a little bit different, but we'll just do a really basic one here. We'll add a event dispatcher to our narrative player controller. And I'm going to call it on item found. And we'll come up to the inputs and add a input. And, you know, this could be the class of the item, but I'm just going to make it a nice little string here, right? I'm just going to say item name. Really simple. And then under begin play, I will uh, search for one and then find the keyboard event for one. And I'll add a keyboard event for two. If you scroll up, there it is there. And if we drag our on item found in, I'm just going to call it. So when you press one, we're going to say that you found a sword, for example, and when you press 2, it's going to be a shield. Now, don't worry, we're going to add some pickups and make proper items in a little bit. I just want to show you this working for now, right? So we'll compile and save, come back into our find item task, and we'll override the begin task function. Now, sometimes tasks need to tick, uh, but in our case, we don't need a task that can tick, so we'll just go to begin task. We can get the owning controller, that's the person that's doing the quest. And then if we drag out, we can cast it to our narrative PC. And we can assign on item found. So what our task is doing here, I'll explain. Our task is going to wait until the player finds an item and then complete itself, right? And so it's only going to do it if the um, item name will do case insensitive is equal to whatever we type in. So we'll say item to find. If this is a little bit confusing, bear with me because it will make sense in a second. So we'll add a branch here. And if the item is the one the player needs to find, then we will add progress, right? We'll add one progress to the task. Compile and save. And again, I know this is probably a little confusing, but this will make sense, I promise. Make sure to click that little I next to item defined as well. And if we compile and save and jump back in, let's um, go to our go to cube task. And I'm going to rename it to find, you know, sword or something like that. And we'll go to quest tasks and get rid of them all. And then we'll add a new one and we'll add a find item task. So you know when you drag out and you can select the task, that's just a, a little convenience thing, right? If you want to change the task at any time, you just come in here and select the one you want. So find item, okay, find item, sword, and that's basically it. So I've hooked it up so that when we press one, it finds the sword item, right? And so let's try this out, I'm gonna hit play. I'm going to press 1 to find the sword, and you can see it completes the quest. The only problem is, notice how it says task description, it really should say find a sword, right? And so this is the other thing, we need to open it up and add the get task description function. And again, this might be a little bit confusing, but just bear with me because you're going to see how this works in just a sec. So format text, we're going to type in find a, and then do curly brackets, and then do item name. And drag that item to find in. And this is really cool now. You guys are going to love this. Check this out. Compile and save. We'll come back into our quest. And check it out. It automatically generates the description for us. 
based on what you type in, right? If you type shield, it's going to say find a shield. If you type sword, it's going to say find a sword. If we compile and save, now it says find a sword. And if I press one, you can see it succeeds the quest. You're probably wondering what add progress does exactly. Well, if I go to my first quest and I go to find a sword, see how it says required quantity? This is the number of times you need to find a sword. If I type five, for example, check this out, I'll compile and save, jump into my quest, and if I press the one key, see how it adds progress to that quest step? And if I find the sword five times, it succeeds the quest. So that's great. If you have a quest where you need to kill 10 wolves or something like that, being able to add a quantity is really good. Optionally, if you want, you can just do a complete task. And what that will do is, even if you've set the quantity to be five, right, it'll complete it in one go. But obviously, you usually don't want to do that. Usually, you want to do add progress instead. And so that's really cool. We can do like find two swords, and we can go to this little arrow and duplicate it. And then we'll come down here and make this one shield. And um, we'll just make it safe to find two shields as well. And now we have a quest where you have to find some swords and some shields. Very cool. You can also go to the actual branch itself. These blue things are called branches. If you go to this branch itself and go to the description, you can actually say what you're doing these tasks for. So for example, you could say get ready for the war, right? And if you try this out in game now, you can see it actually says get ready for the war and then it says find a sword or find a shield, right? And so now we'll just add some very basic pickups to our game. So to add some pickups, we're going to go to blueprint class and make a new actor. And we're going to call this BP underscore pickup. We're going to go to add and add a sphere. And I might make the sphere say 75. I'll go to the text render and add a text render. This is just so we can see what the item is. And I'm going to horizontal align center and I'm just going to say item name. Then go to the sphere, click on it, and then scroll down to begin overlap and add a event. And basically we're going to cast to third person character so that when our character walks into it, we can get our controller cast that to our narrative PC and call on item found. And then we're going to right click on this and promote it to a variable. And we'll click on the little eye down here again so that we can change pickup names. Finally, go to the construction script, drag the text render in and set the text to be the name of the pickup. Again, if you're a little confused, don't worry. This will all become uh, apparent what this is doing in a second. So we'll drag the item name in, we'll hook that up like this, compile, save, and now I'm going to put a pickup in the level, and for its name I'm going to put sword. And you can see the text will actually say what it is too, it'll say sword, right, very cool. I'm going to duplicate that and I'm going to make another sword, and then I'll duplicate that again, and I'll make a shield. And I'll duplicate that, and I'll make another shield. And now, if we uh, play our game, we should be able to actually take these pickups. If I walk into the sword, you can see it's taking the sword, and it's taking the shield. It doesn't actually remove them from the level. What you can do is if you go back into your pickup, you can actually destroy them once the player takes them. And you can see this is already working quite nicely. So that's how you make custom events, right? Say your game needs an obtain item event or a task rather. That's how you do it, right? Okay, I'm going to quickly explain a few more of the quest editor features. And then we're going to take our NPCs that we've made and we're going to make them give us a quest to do. Next up, I'm going to show you how to add some code to your quests. A lot of people are going to want to modify their quests and they want to add things like quest rewards and stuff like that. It's really simple to do. Narrative is made to be easily modifiable. So anytime you want to write code in your quest, add it to your master quest class. And that way, any quests you make will have that code in them as well. It's exactly like making a child of any blueprint, right? It's the exact same um, setup. So we're going to our master quest and let's add quest rewards, right? 
Uh, we'll just add a really basic quest reward system just to show you how it's done. So we'll go to the on quest succeeded function and then I'm going to add a variable called you know quest reward item and on quest succeeded I'm just going to you know print the quest reward item on the screen. Obviously in a real game what you would do is you'd get your player you know you're owning pawn and you'd add the quest reward to their inventory or whatever but because we don't have an inventory system I'm just doing this as an example. And let's say, well, just as an example, we'll also add XP, right? So maybe completing a quest is supposed to give you some XP, so we'll add that feature in as well. This is how easy it is to modify a narrative. So we'll add another print string. We'll just do append. I'm actually going to do a couple of appends here. So we'll say reward item. We'll plug in that reward, and then we'll plug that in like that. And we're going to say, you got um, XP, and then plug in the XP, right? So here's how cool this is, right? You code your reward system. And now, if we go into my first quest and go to the class defaults, see how it has XP up the top? So I might make it so that this quest gives the player 150 XP when they complete it, and it gives you a crossbow or something like that. Compile and save, and now, watch this, when I complete the quest, you got XP 150, reward item crossbow. So that's how easy it is to modify quests and add new features, it's really, really cool. Let me show you one other cool thing you can do. Tasks don't necessarily just check if you've completed a task. Tasks can actually do anything. You can make a task called kill enemies, and the task could even spawn in the enemies. And just to show you like how this would work, let's actually make it so the task can optionally spawn in an item, right? And so what we'll do is we'll come into our task, on begin task, we're gonna spawn in an actor. We'll spawn in one of our pickups. And if you go to your pickup and go to item name, make sure to check expose on spawn. Come back into find item, and we'll just uh, select pickup again. You can see it now asks for an item name. We can just plug in the item to find. We'll add another variable, right? We'll say uh, item spawn transform. And we'll give the player, we'll, we'll give the quest designer the option. They don't have to make it spawn in an item, right? So we'll have like a spawn item variable. And we'll make sure to check that little I there as well on both of those. And so here, if we've selected that we want to actually spawn the item, we can spawn in the item. So this is really cool. Let me show you how this will work. So we'll compile and save. And let's, um, we'll go back into our quest. This isn't going to work with multiple at the moment. So we'll just do one. Right, we'll change it to one sword and one shield, okay? And we'll delete some of our swords and shields. So we've got a sword and we've got a shield, right? We're going to copy the location of the sword open up our quest, where it says find a sword, let's actually paste in that sword location, and we'll check the box that says spawn item, and let's just do it for the shield as well, right? So we'll copy that in there, we'll come into our shield, we'll paste that in there, again we're going to check that spawn item box, and now watch what happens. When this task becomes available, the items will actually spawn in, so we can delete these now, and when we get up to that task in the quest, which we will immediately, it spawns the items in. That's so cool. So that's really useful, right? There's going to be plenty of quests where the item should only spawn in like once the player is doing the quest, for example. And it's really easy to add logic to these tasks. So think of tasks as much more than just checking if the task has been completed. They can do way more. They can even spawn in items. Okay, so now we're going to make it so that Larry gives the player... A quest. So we'll come to our dialogue that we made earlier, our Rick dialogue. We'll open it up. We'll go to Rick Greet actually, and we'll make it so that Rick gives you that quest, right? So um, if we say, "How are you, Rick?" Let's change it. We'll get rid of that event. I don't really need that anymore. We'll just say, um, "I'm not doing so well. There's a war coming, and we don't have any weapons, right?" And let's change that from how are you. We'll just say like, do you need any help? And um, let's disconnect that there. And we'll add an option for the player where the player can say, 
can I help? Might actually put this up here just so it's a bit cleaner looking. So we'll say, can I help? And we'll drag off and we'll say, would you? We'll need at least two swords and two shields to, actually we'll just say one sword and one shield because that's how we made the quest for now. So we'll need a sword and a shield to defend the castle. And you don't have to use narrative for like medieval games. It's, it's useful for any type of game, but I'm just going with that sort of uh, genre. So we'll need a sword and a shield to defend the castle. And then we'll just add an event. And there's an event that comes with narrative called begin quest. And this will automatically begin the quest. So we'll select my first quest. It'll automatically begin the quest when he starts talking. We kind of want it to begin the quest after he's finished talking. So we'll just go to event runtime and hit end. Right. Compile and save. Let's try it out. If we run up to, oh, we're still auto beginning that quest. Let's go back into our narrative player controller. And we'll just disconnect that, right? Because now we're going to start it using dialogue. So we're going to hit play here. And hi, I'm, hi, I'm Rick. Uh, we'll say, do you need any help? I'm not doing so well. There's a war coming and we don't have any weapons. Can I help? Would you? We'll need a sword and a shield to defend the castle. And you can see it's automatically kicked off that quest and now we can do the quest. And you can see that the quest automatically completes, but wouldn't it be nice if you could actually bring the sword and the shield back to Rick, right? It doesn't really make sense that we just have to find it. We should have to bring it back to him. So let's code that in. To do that, we'll come back into that Rick greet dialogue. And you know what? Let's make like a sub dialogue. Let's do that, right? So again, we'll do a sub dialogue. So we're going to come into Rick and we'll duplicate it and we'll make one called the underscore Rick underscore my first quest, right? So we're going to clean this up a little bit and make it its own special little dialogue. And so Rick is going to say here, he's going to say, um, how's the quest coming along? Have you found the weapons? And our player is going to say, I sure have. Or um, if you haven't found the weapons, we're going to say, sorry, I haven't found the weapons yet. Compile and save. And we'll go back into D underscore Rick. And you can see that we've got this Rick greet. We're going to have another sub dialogue now, which is begin dialogue rick underscore my first quest and now again we have that problem we need to select the right one we want to play this one if the quest is in progress so just go to conditions is quest in progress and select my first quest and now if you're doing the rick's quest it'll select that dialogue to play otherwise it'll select this dialogue to play and this is a great way to do dialogue right to organize your dialogue out a bit so we'll compile it and Seems pretty good to me, so let's try that out. We just have to modify our quest a little bit. If we come back into my first quest, you can see that if we find the sword and find the shield, the quest is completed. We want to change it, so you have to bring the items back to Rick. And so what we're going to do is we are going to add another state to the quest, right? So we're going to say, got weapons. That'll be the name of our state. And then we need to talk to rick and give him the weapons so i'm going to show you a task that comes with narrative it's called play dialogue node so if we come into the rick my first quest right you can see there's this i sure have so let's actually rename this we'll give it uh the id player give weapons to rick right we'll copy that we'll come into our quest and then we'll say that the player has to select that dialogue, right? So we'll just use play dialogue node. Player, give weapons to Rick. And it's auto-generated that um, task, but that's not really correct. So we're going to change that. We're going to go to uh, description override. We'll say take the weapons. Or we'll just say talk to Rick. And for the major description, we'll say um, bring the weapons back to Rick. 
And we could even give it the ID, you know, give weapons. Right, this is the task we have to give the weapons back to Rick and then you complete the quest. So you can see the design of our quest has changed a little bit. Now there's two steps, right? You've got to find the weapons, you've got to bring them back to Rick. Again, I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but you will become a lot more familiar with this. It's just a bit of a learning curve. So let's try this out now. We're going to hit play and we're going to walk up to Rick and try out his quest. So Hi. Do you need any help? I'm not doing so well. We'll start his quest. And so we're going to find the sword and the shield. And you can see now it's saying bring the weapons back to Rick. So we're going to do just that. We're going to bring them back to Rick. How's the quest coming along? Have you found the weapons? So you can see it selected the right dialogue because that quest is now in progress. And this is not great, right? You can see we can actually tell him we haven't found the weapons. Even though we have the weapons, it doesn't really make sense. So we'll fix that in a second. But let's just try click on I sure have. And there you go. The quest is complete. And it says you got XP 150. You got crossbow, right? Really, really cool. Love that. So yeah, you can see that bug here that if we ask for the quest and then we come back to him, we can actually tell him we have the weapons even though we don't have the weapons. And this is very easily fixed. So let me show you how to do this. We're going to go back into our Rick quest and we just have to add some conditions, right? So um, basically, if you have the weapons, we want to be able to tell him we have the weapons. And if you don't, we don't. So we're going to copy this got weapons ID. We'll come back into the Rick dialogue here and we'll just add a condition. And there's one that comes with narrative yet again. It's called is quest at state. And we can check if the quest is at the got weapons state. So if you're at the got weapons state, you can tell them that you have the weapons. And we'll just copy these conditions and just paste them on here. But this time we're going to check the box that says not. So are you not at the got weapon state? If you're not at the got weapon state, you'll have to say, sorry, I haven't found them yet, right? Compile and save once again. Going to hit play. And we'll try this out. So we'll say, do you need any help? If we come back to him, he's going to ask if we have the weapons. And because we don't have the weapons, we can't give him the weapons, right? Sorry, I haven't found the weapons yet. But now, if we go and find them, and take them back, now we can give them the weapons. How cool is that? So there you go. Other things I haven't quite touched on, and in fact I don't even know if I mentioned this with the dialogues. Maybe I did, but if you double click a dialogue node, you can call the blueprint event when the dialogue node plays, which can be quite useful. I think I already covered that, but um, quests have the exact same functionality. If you come into the quest, you can double click on any of these and add a event to it. So quests are the exact same and exact same shift click to remove the event. And quest nodes can also have events on them. For example, if I have got the weapons, you know, you could start a dialogue with just your player in it where the player says, you know, I should bring those weapons back. How? Let me show you. Let me show you how to do that. So we'll go to our D master. We'll say D player bring weapons back, something like that. And we'll leave this empty. And we'll add a player response, auto select, come to class defaults, we'll say free movement should be turned on, no, no dialogue camera. And we'll just say, I should bring those weapons back to Rick, right? So I just want to show you this. In quests, you can use these events um, as well. So at, once you have the weapons, I might want the player to say to themselves, I need to bring the weapons back, right? So I could kick off that dialogue. And now, <laughs> very cool. If we grab the quest, once we get the weapons, our player will say to themselves, I should bring those weapons back to Rick, right? See that? So cool. And of course we can bring them back to Rick and it works great. We'll go back into Rick Greet here. I'll just show you like just more on these conditions because the conditions are really important. You're going to use them all the time. Uh, we could go into, we could add a player response, right? And we could add a player response and it's only available after you've completed the quest. So we could add a condition, is quest succeeded? My first quest, right? We might be able to say, Hey, could I get a reward for helping you earlier? 
Right, so you can have a dialogue option only uh, show up after you've completed Rick's quest for him. You might say, sure thing, here you go. And then you could add an event, give item, you know, give item Rick's sword or something like that, you know what I mean? So you can, you can really easily start to create some super cool, uh, complex stuff. So check this out, if I talk to Rick, the option to grab that reward off him won't be available. Right? The option to get the reward didn't show up, but once I bring the weapons back to Rick, if I come back and talk to him, hi, I'm Rick, and check it out. Hey, could I get a reward for helping you earlier? And he gives you Rick's sword, right? So cool. My game's a little bit laggy, by the way. It's just because I'm uh, recording this on my laptop. So one of the things that you can do, narrative seems like a closed off system, but it's really not. So if I come into my player controller, I just want to emphasize, you know, that narrative UI that seems so complicated. You can actually grab the narrative component and you can check if a quest is completed, right? Um, is quest succeeded? You know, you can, um, you can get a quest So actually, let me show you this. I'm going to hook it up so that when you press the one key, it's going to get that quest. We're going to get the current state that your player's at. We'll grab the description. And we'll print it. And let's open our quest back up. And I'm going to actually add some descriptions, right? And you can see it says, this is the start of my quest. Here we'll say, I found the weapons, I need to bring them back to Rick. If we compile and save and actually try this out, if I start his quest and I press the one key, it says this is the start of my quest. So you can access all this stuff. I know the narrative UI seems really complex, but this is all it's doing. It's just reading this quest data and you can read it yourself if you need to. Check it out, I'll find these weapons, and if I press the one key, check it out, it says, I've found the weapons, I need to bring them back to Rick. So if you ever want to make your own UI, you can do it quite easily. There's actually an example quest journal that comes with narrative that does a lot of this for you. It's a little bit ugly, but it helps you immensely if you want to do something like this. So when I press one, we're going to make a widget, and we'll add the quest journal. You need to plug in your narrative component and then just add it to the viewport. And so this is just a little example quest journal that comes with narrative and it shows you your quests and objectives and things like that. And it's not terribly complicated. There's a bit of code there, of course, um, but not that much. And you'll see what it does. Um, if I press one, right, it's a really ugly quest journal at the moment. I do need to make it a bit prettier, but it's a really good example and you can style it to your game's needs. You can see that if I start the quest, and I open my quest journal, right? It's in my active quests. And I've forgotten to mention, but you can have as many quests going at one time as you like, right? And you can see the objectives here. It says, this is the start of my quest. And if I, you know, find one of the items, you can see it updates the quest journal. And if I find the other one, you can see here, I found the weapons, I need to bring them back to Rick. And if I complete the quest, and open the journal, you can see it's now in finished quests. So that's an example of a quest journal. And you know, you might like to add something like that to your game as well. The other really powerful thing about quests and dialogue is all of it is saved to disk, every quest you've done and things like that. So, you know, we've got this Rick quest and you can ask for a reward if you've completed the quest and whatnot. Um, but say you complete the quest and then you close the game and you open it back up later, this will still show up because it's going to remember that you've succeeded this quest because it gets saved to disk. So I'm going to show you how to use the save system. It's really, really simple. Um, we'll just come down here and add a keyboard event for three. So when you press the two key, we'll save your game. So I'll just get rid of this for now. And we'll just print string. We'll just say saving. And then when you press three, we will load your game back in. 
and we're gonna say loading dot 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 and this is just the coolest thing ever let me show you this so if we play the game and I open that quest journal up you can see that the quest is not in here right I'm gonna come up to Rick I'm going to get the quest off him and I'm gonna press 2 to save the game okay so you can see it says saving if I open the quest journal the quest is here I'm gonna close the game open it back up if I open my quest journal it's not there but if I press 3 to load my save game check it out my quest is loaded back into memory and now all the dialogues are going to work too right check this out how's the quest coming along right my dialogue my NPCs remember that I'm doing the quest it all gets loaded back in it's so cool Finally, we'll discuss data tasks. Narrative stores a big database of every task the player has ever completed and how many times they have completed it. For example, every time you jump, we could complete that data task, and now you can track the amount of jumps the player has ever done in their lifetime. Even if they close the game and reopen it, it's saved to disk across all of their play sessions. And it might not sound that useful being able to track how many times a player has ever jumped, but what about knowing every NPC the player has killed? All of a sudden, this opens up some powerful options, right? An NPC could scream and yell at you if you've killed his brother, or a dialogue option could become available, but only if you've visited a certain city before. And being able to check anything the player has ever done and have it all saved to disk with a small lightweight save file, it's really, really powerful. So as an example, let's track every item the player has ever found, just to show you how to implement these data tasks. So I've put my sword pick up in the level here just to show you this. We've got you know these items let's make it so that we track every item the player's ever found using data tasks it's actually really simple so we'll go to narrative data task and we'll make one called find item and if you open it up it's got the name of the task which is just find item and then the description about the task and it's also got this argument so tasks consist of a task asset in this case find item and then an argument in this case the argument is the item's name and that's how it stores all this data. So let me just show you. This will become a little bit more obvious here. On begin play, I'm going to drag on item found in, and I will assign to that event so that whenever we find an item, I'll tell narrative to track it using data tasks. So we'll drag narrative in, and we will complete a narrative data task. Depending on the task you select, the argument will change. So check this out. If I click on our find item task, it's asking for the item's name. So tasks are the task asset and then a string argument and that's how tasks are tracked by narrative so in this case we can just plug the item's name in you might use the item's name if you had a kill character task you might use the character's name or so on we will compile and save this and now what you can do is uh, we'll add a for event here so we'll just type for and then scroll up and look for the event we can drag narrative in and get the number of times a task has been completed, right? We can check how many times you've found a sword before. And we'll and we'll print that out onto the screen here. Compile and save. And so if I play my game and press 4, you can see it says 0 because I've never found a sword. But if I take the sword here and press 4, you can see it says 1. Here's where the system gets really powerful. This is all saved to disk, right? So if I save my game by pressing 2 and I close the game. If I open it back up later, I'm going to load the game, pressing 3, and then 4, you can see it says 1. So it's tracking how many times I've found a sword before. And so having access to all this information is really quite useful. In fact, you might have noticed in Narrative that Narrative seems to remember any dialogue options that you've selected before, right? It grays them out. And actually, if I say goodbye here, and I save my game, and then I close the game, and I load the game back in, you'll see that it remembers that I've selected these options before, even though I've closed the game. That's because Narrative actually uses these data tasks to remember all the options you've selected before. In fact, if you go to plugins, narrative content, and go to default tasks, you can see there it is there, play dialogue node, and it's tracking every dialogue node and the ID of the node that you've ever selected, and it can use it. There's almost too many uses for this to name, but, you know, for example, you could have Rick say a certain dialogue line. It could be like, I heard you'd found a sword somewhere, you know. And you can make him only say that if the player has completed data task, find item, 
sword, right? And because it's all saved to disk, that will work. Even if you save the game, open it back up, he'll say that only if you've found a sword before. So the use of these tasks, they're pretty useful. In fact, if we open up my first quest, you can even add them as quest tasks. If you go to complete narrative data task and go to find item sword, you can actually use them as quest tasks, right? If I uh, start that quest and I find the sword, it's completed that quest step and it's done that only using these data tasks. It didn't actually use my find item task we made earlier, it just used a data task. Where these get particularly interesting is you can actually go to that find item sword task and check the box retroactive. Because narrative's keeping a database of every time you found a sword, if you check this box retroactive, it will actually check if you've already found the sword and complete the step. And this is pretty interesting. You can find the sword first, then start the quest, and it will complete the quest step, right? It's saying I should bring the weapons back to Rick because it's retroactively going back and checking, have you done that already in the past? So that's kind of another use of these data tasks. You might not use those data tasks often, but when you do use them, they will come in handy and it's really nice that they're saved to disk. That's kind of the main advantage of them. These blueprint tasks are just kind of one-off things that are used in quests, whereas these data tasks are more kind of permanent storage and they're stored very efficiently. If your player has done 5 million tasks, um, these are stored in such a way where there's not going to be a huge save file or anything like that. Finally, narrative is perfectly configured for networked games. If I play as a client, you just have to remember to start quests and dialogue on the server, um, and that's really the only thing you need to remember. But check this out, right? Hi, I'm Rick. We're going to do Rick's quest. The only thing is in a networked game, you can't skip the dialogue options with enter at the moment. You just have to wait for the dialogue to play out. And if we find the sword item, you can see that works. And we'll bring it back to Rick. And there we go. You can see it's working really well. And the server can give the rewards. And it's all, it's all server authoritative. The coolest thing about this is that it is server authoritative. So if your player is doing this quest, they'll only be able to select this dialogue option if they're actually at the state in the quest. The server will check these conditions, and if the client tries to select one they're not allowed to, the server will disallow it. So it's server authoritative, and it will stop your players from trying to cheat, which is uh, a big deal in an online game. Really quickly, just want to explain why we couldn't use a Rick node for our backlinking and why we had to use a player node. The simple answer is that when you hit a player node, Narrative will then check all of the conditions. But if you have an NPC node, it won't check all the conditions ahead of it. And this is because Narrative generates its dialogue in chunks. If I select this line here, Narrative will instantly grab all of these and it will grab this and th it will it will use that as the next chunk and it checks all of those conditions in one go. If you don't use a player response, it will keep looking and it won't recheck these conditions, right? So if you want it to check all the conditions, use a player node. In fact, I would say as a general rule, just use the player node for backlinking. I'll probably have this fixed in the future, but you may as well just do it this way um, and it will guarantee that your conditions will work perfectly. One thing I actually missed out and um, I, I want to explain is the get line duration function. So by default, it will wait until the audio is finished playing and then it will go to the next line. So it uses the length of the audio by default. However, if you want that to be different, you can override the get line duration function and you could just return a value like 10 seconds. And if you do this, Every line of dialogue is going to last for 10 seconds. In fact, let's just do one second just to show this off. No matter how long the audio is, it will always go for one second because I've put that override in. So let me show you that. Uh, so we'll say, do you need any help? Do you need it? I'm not doing so. Right? See how it's only lasting one second? For a lot of games, you want the player to have to press enter to move to the next line of dialogue. And so uh, you could actually use like 9999, like a really high number. And that way the dialogue line will never really end. You'll have to press enter to skip the line manually. Uh, so I can show you that as well. Hey there, I'm Rick. Right. 
And there you go, nothing happens. We have to press enter to skip to the next slide. So that's a way you can achieve that sort of functionality if you want. It's by overriding the line duration. Um, and by default, it uses the duration of the sound, but you could you could do whatever you wanted. Or if you, um, if you had a high number like 999, you could have the player skip it. You can also, I believe you could do skip current line, yeah. And that will skip the line. So that does the same thing as pressing the enter key if you wanna skip the line using code. So that's what get line duration does, very useful. Um, and I also probably should have mentioned this, but you can also override where the speaker's head is. That helps narrative know where to point the uh, camera. So you could like get the head socket or whatever. It does a good job out of the box, I think, but if you need to, you can override it. You can also do things like overriding how the sound gets played. For example, if I override the sound to do nothing, right? I won't do anything. Narrative will not play any sound. Check this out. Right? You can see it's not playing any sound because when narrative tries to play sound, it'll call this function. And by default, it's going to play the sound for you. But if you override it, you can make it do whatever you want. You can make it play the sound. Um, so we'll just hook that in. But you might want to play the sound in half pitch, right? Or you might want the sound to be played at a quieter volume, right? Uh, so you can do all that as well. And so that's just a little bit on, um, on these. And you can also do like... If you want to override how the, the sound is played, you can do that. You can also override how the animation is played, or you can even override how a whole dialogue node is played. If you override play NPC dialogue, for example, you can override that to do nothing. And watch what happens. Playing an NPC dialogue line, it won't do anything. It won't play any audio. It won't, won't do anything, right? You have to actually code it to do something now. So you can override huge pieces of um, narrative from blueprints if you want. And so that's uh, some of the functions you can do. There's also a nice tick dialogue if for whatever reason you have to do something every frame in your dialogue, you've got that there as well. Um, so yeah, and then there's some nice ones like on begin dialogue, you know, everything you need. And while we're on it, of course, um, quests do the same, right? You can override task completed, on quest failed, you could, you know, remove some XP from the player, whatever you want to do. So those functions are there in the quest and dialogue blueprints to use. If you're upgrading to Narrative 3 from an earlier version of Narrative, if you come into your tasks down here, back in Narrative um, 2 point whatever, you would have tasks and you would add these data tasks and that's how quests used to work. But now they use these um, new quest tasks, right? These blueprint based tasks. So if you want to convert your old Narrative 2.x quests into Narrative 3 ones, simply go to quest tasks, complete Narrative data task, and then you can just copy your old tasks over. I'm just going to copy and paste all of the stuff over. And now this will work in Narrative 3. So if you're upgrading from an old version, you'll have to um, copy all of your old tasks over to new ones. Dialogues should work fine. However, um, I would recommend if anything does not work for whatever reason, delete your dialogue and recreate it. And that should uh, fix any issues you have. But hopefully you don't have any issues, um, but there may be some. Upgrading from two to three might cause some problems because there are a lot of changes. For quests though, you will explicitly have to copy these old ones over to the new ones for it to work. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you love narrative as much as I do. And if you have any questions, please come into the Discord. It will be in the description. Go into the narrative channel. We have the narrative forum as well. And you can ask any questions, there's tons of discussion and help, and um, we're always around to answer questions in here. So yeah, thanks for watching the video.